All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to quickly get started with some introductions. So thank you for joining us online for the panel discussion for We Were Farmers. I'm Aditi and I work at Objective Center for Photography and Film. So for those of you new to Objectives, uh, we were established in 2003 as a nonprofit visual arts center that's dedicated to photography and film. And we present a year on program of exhibitions, screenings, workshops, developmental programs, residencies and more both at our premises and online so you can visit us at, at www.objectives.com.sg to find out more we're really excited to be presenting the exhibition we were farmers by ore waiting at objectives chapel gallery Ore's family have been farmers for generations from the 1960s till 2020 and we were farmers is the culmination of her 12-year personal project documenting from her unique position of participant observer, so both as a documentary photographer and as a member of the family, um, the family's experience and resilience against the backdrop of Singapore's urbanization over the years. So together with the exhibition, she has also launched a photo book of the same title. We Were Farmers is supported by the National Arts Council, the Arts Fund and RJ Paper. So tonight's program will start with a presentation by Ore on We Were Farmers, followed by a discussion with her and the curator Tuang Wu Bin. And then we will hear from visual sociologist Terence Hing, who has contributed a wonderful afterword to the book about his involvement with the project and his response to the images. So uh, throughout, please feel free to leave your questions um, either in the chat box or using the Q&A feature. Before we start, I'd briefly like to highlight Objective's Code of Conduct. So to maintain a safe and inclusive space, please treat everyone with courtesy and respect and harassment or discrimination will not be tolerated and such participants will be removed from the webinar. I will briefly introduce the speakers for tonight and we will learn more about them um, through their presentations. So Ori Huying is a documentary photographer from Singapore drawn to narratives of people and places affected by development in Southeast Asia. She has held solo exhibitions at Objectives in Laos and in Cambodia and has participated in numerous group shows. Her accolades include recognition by World Press Photo and National Geographic, and she has worked with international publications, NGOs and commercial clients in addition to her personal projects. Then we have Tuang Wu Bin, who is a writer, curator, and artist. He focuses on the photographic practices of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong, and his publications include the award-winning book, Photography in Southeast Asia, a survey. He received his PhD from the University of Westminster, London, in January 2021. We have Terence Heng, who is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Liverpool, United Kingdom, and he's joining us from overseas today. Um, he has authored three books and his research ambulates through the intersections of cultural geography, visual sociology and photographic practice. So um, over to Ori and if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. We hope to have a really lively and informal discussion. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight and for your interest in my Rural Farmers project. Um, as I speak, I'm going to share a slideshow of my uh, book, the images from my book, so that, you know, you don't have to stare at my face. So, um, yes, let me see this Okay. Okay. Um, It's a uh, puzzling, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, this project is uh, very close to my heart. It's about my family, uh, the people who raised me and who made me who I am today. So it's first and foremost a tribute to them, showing them my appreciation and um, re returning a, a fraction of their love. So um, I also like to share my family's journey with others through storytelling. I think it's easy to forget the sacrifices that the older generations have made for us and the effort that it takes to raise a family. So I hope that uh, my work will make you reflect on your own family and loved ones. At the same time, I feel that uh, farming is very similar to raising a family. 
uh, you have to take care, you know, you have to take special care of the young siblings and then you have heartaches and sleepless nights if they don't grow well. And uh, there's so much uh, sacrifices involved in farming. If you don't believe me, um, just ask any farmers when's the last time that uh, they take a vacation. And uh, even if they did, uh, you know, their mind is uh, constantly on the farm. So to me, both farming and raising a family, it's a labor of love, right? Especially in Singapore, right? I mean, Singapore where the future of the farming is all about the technology. Uh, people tend to underestimate the role of humans in the process, especially um, the growers who understand the characteristics of the produce, uh, you know, the plants, the fish, the cow, for example, uh, like the back of their hand. And you know they can they're the ones who can tell what's wrong with it just by you know just by looking at it. So I hope that uh, my project will shed some light on the efforts behind farming and make people appreciate their local farmers and think about how we can uh, achieve food sustainability going forward, you know, both on a personal and uh, national level. So um, this project took me 12 years to complete from 2009 to 2020. The span of this project uh, runs parallel to the development, to my development as a photographer. It's a reflection of it as well. When I started shooting in 2009, uh, it was also the start of my photography journey. I wanted to be a photojournalist then, hence uh, the choice of shooting in black and white film. And in 2010, I went to London to study my MA in photojournalism and documentary photography at uh, London College of Communication. Um, I stayed there for two years after that. So during that time, I started exploring medium format photography and I fell in love with it instantly. So when I returned to Singapore, I continued my documentation with a medium format camera. I also shot a video interview with my grandmother. Uh, having been exposed to multimedia during my time at LCC. I'm really glad I did because uh, she has uh, you know, such a strong character and the interview really showed that in a way that the photos can't. Um, so now I'd like to show a multimedia piece that I did with my black and white photos and the interview uh, with her. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ตาคุณดิเตอร์นี่แหละของก็ Tukitotakin that's 
ไอ้ฝ่ายที่ไม่จูกังไปกาลงตองเจ้าหัวเจ็ดสิบเอ็ดเมียUm, it wasn't. It wasn't always easy for me to find motivation to shoot my family because you know I always assumed that uh, that day and the farm will be around. So one of the crucial moments during this process when uh, when I was in London, my parents told me that uh, there was an investor interested in buying over the farm, and the family is uh, considering the deal. You know, they 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 actually want you know they they want it to go through. Um, for me, that that was that was quite a big shock because the farm, as I knew it, might not be around when I returned, and you know I I I'm not going to even be there to witness to witness that. So luckily, the deal didn't go through, and uh, I, I got a sense of urgency to continue shooting after I got back uh, to Singapore. And uh, another moment is uh, in 2014. I started helping out at the farm, uh, learning the ropes from my dad and my uncles, and I also moved subsequently to stay at the farm. So this presented both opportunities and challenges for my documentation. Obviously, being on the farm 24 hours, you know, allowed me more time to shoot, and also being there, and also uh, to be able to be there when something extraordinary happened. So, for example, uh, there was a hailstorm in 2018. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be there and uh, to, to be able to document <coughs> the, the aftermath of it. And uh, I was also able to understand more about the working aspect of the farm. But at the same time, uh, you know, I was expected to, to be helping out. And whenever I was shooting, I was seen as not working. So, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a complicated relationship. Yeah. So um, another pivotal moment was when the family decided to close down our farm, our operation after the lease ended. And uh, you know, there was a finality to the situation. And then from then onwards, I was shooting with the end in mind and that's around uh, 2017. Yeah. So uh, the motivation for me working on this project was to document my family's experience and to preserve my family's legacy so that, um, hold on, I'm just gonna screen there. Okay, yeah. So the motivation for me working on this project is to document my family's experience and to preserve uh, my family's legacy so that uh, our future generations can understand where we come from. And uh, for me, that's where the book and the exhibition comes in. It's very much about creating a narrative, right, from all the documents that I have over the years. But the problem and the challenge is that uh, I'm too close to the story. So all the photos that I took, you know, they are important to me because they all took effort to create. And uh, that's when I decided to approach Rubin to, uh, to help me to edit my book and also to curate the exhibition. Um, he has a lot of uh, experience with uh, crafting narratives and in editing and curating. Um, and he's also very much in tune with the photographic practices in the region. So I, I, I trust him with my work. Um, he will elaborate on his processes and experience working on the book and exhibition later. Um, for now, I would like to show a short video on the making of the book uh, from my perspective. Okay. Okay. We 
Rural Farmers is a way for my family's legacy to live on. It's also a tribute to my ancestors, whom I've never met, but nonetheless helped shape me into who I am today. I see it as a love letter to my family. Before I pass the discussion over to Rubin, I would also like to mention that uh, there's an interpretive dance video as part of the exhibition. And uh, it's a collaboration between a good friend, Wendy, who's a theatre practitioner and a dancer, and also my husband, Juan, who directed, shot, and edited the video. It's really their take on uh, my family story. And uh, yeah, I can show you a short trailer of it, but uh, for the full video, please uh, check, uh, yeah, go to the exhibition. <laughs> I don't know. All right, thank you for your sharing, Ori. So um, as she has mentioned, uh, the video that you just saw a trailer of is of a dance performance that you can view in full at the exhibition at Objectives Ch uh, Chapel Gallery. It plays on a screen there. So uh, now we will loop Wubin into the conversation. I think Ori has mentioned a little bit about why she approached him to help her with uh, curating the exhibition and the book. Uh, Wubin, would you like to share a bit about how you came to be involved, as well as whether you were previously familiar with Ori's work as well, or how you got to know more about it? Okay, thanks for inviting me to come into the, to join the webinar. I'm going to do a bit of product placement <laughs> here. Uh, sorry. So this is the book. Um, get it now because it's like uh, you have ex like exhibition discount. So actually, I... I I knew of Huing's work uh, for quite a long time. Um, I might have also even seen the first edition or the first version of the, the, sh the show, which was exhibited at Objectives 2013, 2014, right? Um, yeah, 2014, yeah. And then I think over time, I've like over the past few years, I've also exhibited uh, other projects by Huing. And then I, I actually cannot remember why she contacted me to uh, be involved but anyway I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity so actually I'll just talk a little bit about the process behind uh, putting the book and the exhibition together so actually we started with the book and um, what, the first thing that we, I that we did was actually to to assemble all the images that first Hui Ying shot over the years initially as, as she has mentioned she started shooting in 35mm black and white format when, when when, when she uh, was trying out to be a photojournalist. Later on, she shot in square format film. Um, so we assembled all those, all those images together. But also at the same time, uh, we wanted to have a sense of history of, of her family. So of course, we started thinking about incorporating family photographs and from the family album. And, um, and then also other news reports and documents that we could accumulate uh, and find. And then um, I think we had quite a lot of images and the first process is actually really to cut down the number of images that we are working with. And I think I, I, I kind of did a cowling process which went down to, I think, not, not, not uh, too few. I think there were still a few hundreds of images. And then um, I had to, uh, so what I, uh, what I typically would do in this situation is I create a kind of structure. Uh, so I, I create a kind of, structure in my mind and then I start to slot the, the pictures into the structure. And, 
and uh, there are different aspects uh, within the structure itself. There are different parts. For instance, there are two. There, there, there might be a juxtaposition, juxtaposition of two images, or a sequence of a few images that might be intuitive. But on the whole, there is a structure to seed the entire work within. And then once I have the structure, it's also a way of like a, a, a kind of like my preference of working so that with the structure, I can easily convey to Hui Ying uh, what we want to achieve with this book. Um, and then, of course, we let the first edit sit and fester and manifest for a while. Uh, and then the, we started again the process of tweaking and taking out certain things, rearranging certain things until we were both satisfied. Actually, the, the slideshow that you saw just now is not exactly the final version of the book. Um, it's a, I think it's an earlier draft. The, the final version looks a little bit different in terms of alignment. Um, so that's how the book came about. Uh, I don't want to say too much to spoil the pleasure for, for people who might want to buy the book or to see the exhibition. And then after the book is more or less created, I, we, we, the, the next step is actually to turn it into the space, the exhibition. Uh, and, the, and for me, the translation is not so direct. There, there is obviously some connection between what happens or unfolds in the book and what happens within the experience of the exhibition and within the space of objectives. Uh, to put it in a very simple way, the idea in the space itself is actually to create two chambers, what I would call two chambers. There's an, there's an exterior chamber and then there is an interior chamber. And if you stand at the door, if you enter the exhibition space and you stand at the door, on your right side, there is a wall that connects the inner chamber and the, uh, the external chamber. Uh, you can call it an umbilical cord, which connects the two spaces, the two chambers. Uh, and I think to put it in a simpler way, um, the exterior chamber is more of a kind of overview or a kind of general view of farming life. When we enter the inner chamber, uh, Hui Ying's subjectivity or Hui Ying's position as both the as the photographer, as the as as a daughter, as a member of this large extended family, as a young member of the of this farming uh, family, all these different positions become a bit more obvious. So that's what I try to do within the the inner chamber. Uh, and for people who have already seen the show, you would have maybe noticed that we exhibited quite a variety of materials on the wall. So there are newspaper documents. Uh, there are loose sheets from a publication that Hui Ying was involved in, uh, that platform uh, mounted some years, some years ago in celebration of SG50. So there were loose sheets from that publication. Uh, then you see, of course, uh, exhibition prints uh, of different sizes, some with uh, white border, some without. And then you see screen capture of the video, uh, the interview that she did with uh, her grandmother. And then I think we have reproductions of old family photographs. Uh, and, and, and it's quite, I mean, it's obviously deliberate the, in the way that we decided to display many of these materials. Uh, I think it's I, I would just say that it's fairly important for us at this present age of the Instagram where there is a kind of demarcation when you come to the space to experience an exhibition. And, and I want to foreground that experience of print and materiality in the show. So I, I will just uh, stop here for the time being. Okay, thank you so much for sharing those insights. I think it's uh, very rich and definitely for those who have visited the show already will be quite some food for thought. And for those who have not yet had the chance to visit, please do. And hopefully this will enhance your experience of the exhibition as well. Perhaps I can just chime in with a couple of questions here um, before we get to the Q&A. So um, one of the things that uh, is apparent from the book as well as the exhibition is that there is not a lot of additional context provided um, 
for the images in terms of say a caption accompanying each one or um, a sheet that you know viewers will actually take to guide them through the show. Uh, could you share more about whether this was a deliberate intention? Uh, am I supposed to say answer this or Huying supposed to? Oh, it's it's it? any uh, of you. Can, you can, yeah, Wu Bing can answer it, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I took, the short answer would be yes, it's deliberate <laughs> to not have captions. Um, what we try to mitigate in terms of information in the book itself and also within the exhibition is to provide a kind of timeline. So actually a lot of the information that you would typically see, let's say if we do the book with captions, a lot of the information that you would require us to supply via caption, you can actually read it in the timeline. So with the timeline in mind, you should be able to roughly navigate the book. Um, I think it's deliberate because we want to kind of, uh, or at least I want to kind of keep it a little bit more open. and. I'm also not sure if uh, a member of the audience or the audience of the book, the readers of the book would necessarily need a lot of the uh, details of like provided for individual pictures. So I thought having the timeline would be a very nice way of kind of providing a context instead of having captions. I, I also feel that, you know, the one of the reasons why we left out the caption is that you I, I really want to give the audience the, the, the space to, you know, to make their own uh, to, to to leave it to their own imagination to to make it to, to make their own interpretations and you know like try to um, yeah think about what the relationship between the photos that was presented, what it means to them, because there's no there's no correct answer, you know. Um so yeah, I, I do want to leave some space for that, hence uh, no caption. Yeah. I see. Uh, so something that I felt as I walked through the exhibition and flipped through the book, uh, being of course very unfamiliar with farming in general and in Singapore, is that um, you know a lot of viewers might have certain idealized notions of farming in Singapore or even outdated notions of farming in Singapore. Um, is there anything in the images that um, you've either heard from viewers or that you yourself feel um, counters these ideas or presents something that's quite unexpected? Mm, I think most people are, you know, they are interested in the, um, there are certain photos that people have uh, asked me a lot about. So one of it is the, obviously the, the accident that happened mm. on the farm. Uh, yeah, with, uh, with, with my auntie's fall. But actually that's not, that's I mean that's not even that's that's actually not as the result of the day to day operation on the farm but you know the farm still uh, I mean that, that was the only serious accident that we've had or uh, incident that we've had at the farm but still you know a farm is is a is a workplace with uh, tools and machinery so it it does have that uh, that risk element in, involved and also I think the other photos that uh, the other photo that we talked about is the is the archival photo of the pig. Um, yeah, the pig being slaughtered for for uh, for ceremony, right? Uh, so the older generations can really relate to that because I think they've seen that before. But whereas for the younger generations, that uh, that's something quite fascinating. I, I feel that uh, what a lot of you got from from the photos is how much effort, how much work, like manual labor it, it takes, you know, to to grow the vegetables, to to harvest it, to to pack it even. So yeah, that's something that that's that's the reality. But a lot of people don't know about because you know that they, they don't see the um, the work that's being done behind the scenes. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we've got two questions coming from the audience that I think we can address now before we move on to hear from Terence, who will also um in his afterward to the book has uh, talked about labor as represented in the images as well. So we will come back to some of these points. So um. The two questions are kind of related in a way. So one of them uh, says, this is a really amazing project. I was wondering about the farm workers too, assuming not all of them are your family members who features in the project's photos, but are in a way silent. We see them, but don't know much about them. So the question is asking what has become of uh, some of the farm workers featured who are not your family members and how they came to be involved. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I wish I could uh, add more photos of, of the workers, of my family members in, in the book and exhibition, but of course, I'm limited by space and, and the narrative uh, structure. Uh, so the workers, uh, the, the, the last, I mean, the last of the last batch of the workers, they were from uh, Burma and from Thailand. So the Thai, the Thai workers were involved in the production, uh, production work, whereas the Burmese workers, they were in the uh, packing, and some of them were drivers as well. Um, we got them through a mixture of uh, agencies, and also uh, for the Thai workers, uh, it's quite, it's quite amazing how we got them because, uh, you know, they would. Um, like if we need workers, we will ask them to ask uh, back in their village, like either their family or friends, and then you know we would make arrangements uh, to order people for them to come over. So that 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 has always been how we got our Thai workers. Yeah. Um. So when the farm is closing down, we did ask them whether would they like to uh, go back home or would they like to continue working in Singapore. And most of them chose to go go back home. And for those who would like to continue, we, we try to find work for them, like, you know, asking um, the other farms. And, and some of them managed to successfully secure uh, employment. Yeah. Mm. All right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's really wonderful to hear that they were able to kind of pursue what they wish to do after working on this farm. We have another question from Kelvin in the chat who asks, is there any interesting photo or info that you have left out during the editing process? Considering that this is a long-term project, is there anything that you felt can be added more? Uh, um, I, I think, of course, you know, there are other photos that, that I find interesting, or even maybe Ruby or Terence found interesting, but we, we didn't add them in because of the narrative structure. I mean, we, we do have to, yeah, we need to have a structure to that. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if it's too early, but Terence was talking about um, you know, doing something together after this, like uh, making use of uh, some of the photos that, that was not included, that's not included in the exhibition and photos. And then, yeah, so hopefully, you know, we will really see more of, more of the photos. Yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you for sharing. Perhaps at this stage, uh, we can move on to hear from Terence, and then we can address some other questions that are coming in that would also uh, touch on what he says. So uh, Terence can then chime in as well. Thanks, Aditi. Uh, just let me share a screen because you probably don't want to see my face throughout all the time that I'm talking. Okay, so I'm very honoured to have written the afterword to this book. I was approached by Hui Ying, I think probably around February or April, and we met, um, I think about seven or eight years ago when we were looking to find a curator to help us do a heritage project on Pongo as part of our SG50 uh, activities with the Singapore Institute of Technology when I was working there. And then I found out about Hui Ying's work um, with, with, and her own personal family history uh, with, you know, and those kinds of connections with Pongol as well as farming. And I thought, wow, that's really, really interesting. And when she approached me with saying, oh, I'm doing a book and an exhibition on farms and farming life, I, I was both intrigued and I was also well actually a bit empathetic because now I live where I live I'm surrounded by farmland and uh, in my everyday life I actually see farmers in their tractors going up and down the farms and everyone tells me there's no money in farming it's really tough it's really hard and then you start to feel feel the pain and to a certain extent I kind of saw a bit of that pain I mean I, I'm not not just physical but emotional um, pain and labor in the photographs uh, that she showed. So this two page spread, which I pulled from the book uh, was actually the, the photograph on the left was the one that struck me the most of all the images in the book. This was the one that made me think really, really hard about what Hui Ying was trying to do with her work and what she was trying to say. Um, and I think it's significant because as we know, agriculture is not something that comes to mind, you know, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when someone says Singapore. When, you know, to the rest of the world, Singapore is this super urban, hyper modern technological country that, you know, that projects itself as the bastion of modernity. We are a nation of engineers, bureaucrats, technocrats, and technologists. And even when we talk about agriculture these days in Singapore, 
I think most of the time the narrative is spun around the techniques of agriculture rather than the product itself or the, the individuals or the labor that goes into it. And most often the time when we talk about agriculture ends up being some debate about whether the land is being used in the most efficient way possible and you know and whether we should just raise it to the ground and build more roads and shopping malls etc cetera, etc cetera. i think there's a bit more balance now but at the same time um Huing's book is important because it brings to the front this additional layer of life in singapore so and not, and as Wupin was saying just now about the external and internal chambers, on the surface, we see the work of the farm. And that in itself is actually really important because it shows another facet of Singaporean life. Um, but the inner chamber is about the human and social aspect of farming itself. Farming isn't just about planting seeds, pulling up uh, the produce, selling it to the market and then going home. It's not a nine to five job. It's a very involved job. Um, in my afterward, I wrote about how the labor is physical and emotional and spiritual all at the same time. And I think that what gave us an additional perspective here was, as Hui Ying said, was that she lived and worked on the farm as she photographed. So it is that insider view that you don't always see in documentary photography. You know, when most of us end up doing projects and documenting something, we often come in as outsiders. Uh, or we come in as passive observers. Uh, what Huying has done is offer us a kind of almost autobiographical view of the farm. And as what we researchers would say, an autoethnographic uh, approach to documenting farm life in Singapore. So what then we have is this kind of very intimate, raw insight into the life and death on a Singaporean farm. It shows us uh, what it means to live a life that is less lived, uh, but also how particular individuals who don't necessarily follow the standard hegemony of Singapore life, uh, how they struggle against different narratives of modernity, not just the state. I mean, of course, the state plays a really big role uh, in all our lives as Singaporeans, but you know, the, the, the expectations of society um, the, the, and the desires of different generations. So I'll just finish off by talking, you know, a little bit about why I think the book is also sociologically significant. Um, it's not just in terms of content, uh, but I also think it's the style. It's the way that the individuals and the objects I approach and splice together. And of course, we've been plays an important role here in developing that structure of narrative throughout the book. My afterword was a response to that structure, the way the photographs were sequenced, the way they were juxtaposed against each other on the spreads. Um, like I said before, it's autobiographical, but it's also relationship centric. So that tells a really good story um, uh, about the human element within the farm. And doing that bridges that gap between documentary photography as being inherently visual and sociology, which is what I do, as traditionally textual. We need more of these kinds of books and publications uh, that, that create that social story and narrative so that we can do things other than describing them in words, but actually showing uh, people what we see. So that's all I have to say, uh, won't talk too long, but happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. I guess uh, before we get to the questions that are coming in, just a couple of other things that were very interesting from your afterword. So you had written in the afterword about, you had referenced sociologist Paul Gilroy's Roots and Roots concept, which I will type in the chat to explain <laughs> because the spelling is not so clear. So this refers to various material things and cultural forms that migrants bring with them when they leave their point of origin that continue to tie their identities in some tangible way. Uh, you had mentioned objects just now. Would you be able to perhaps um, elaborate on this concept a little bit just for everyone to get an appreciation of it? Okay. Um, well, I like to joke that I'm a material girl living in the material world. Sorry about the 80s reference. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I'm fascinated with material culture in my research. I'm, I'm really interested in the way people relate to and make use of objects as a way to perform their identity uh, or as a way to 
you know, uh, to, to talk about themselves, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously. So a lot of my work revolves around religion, uh, particularly Chinese religion and how the use of objects within religion uh, tell, tells us things about, that people won't necessarily talk about. In this case, uh, when, what Gilroy was discussing was, and, and Gilroy, Gilroy's work revolves around the, the Black Atlantic and how individuals from the Caribbean would bring various objects or cultural forms, that things like music, you know, uh, from their point of origin into, an, into where they migrate to. So it was how a diasporic community was able to perpetuate their identity in a host country. Um, and in this case, when I, when I think about roots and roots, there was a play on the word of the vegetable roots that Hui Ying's own uh, desires brought her outside of Singapore into London and then back again. Uh, and it was a way of trying to show how significant the farm was as, as a site of material culture. So, you know, at, in Singapore, we don't pay it as much attention as I, as I think we should um, on locations and spaces that are important to our heritage and to our past. Uh, we are very ready to wipe things out. And I think the, the farm was a, not necessarily a victim, but uh, uh, a, it, it kind of became part of the whole tabula rasa narrative uh, wipe it, wipe it clean off the ground, and then build something on top of that. Uh, roots and roots remind us that we need to maintain, in some form, these spaces, not just digital, uh, but physical as well. All right, thank you for sharing. Uh, so, one more interesting thing that came to mind, um, especially when you talk about how this project reflects, um, kind of the the challenges of living a life that is not in line with what the majority in Singapore does, for example, is that um, I was thinking about how, you know, especially since COVID started in a way, um, a lot of people have taken up farming or gardening on a small scale within their homes. It's almost like it's come full circle to uh, become a sort of gentrified activity, which in a way is, is also interesting because um, it is encouraging people to be more in touch with nature, uh, to understand like where their food comes from. Um, do you also, do you and perhaps um, Ori as well have any thoughts about uh, this kind of shift in culture and what it reflects about society's, uh, you know, changing perception on these, on these kinds of uh, jobs? It, it's interesting because I just had a conversation with my wife about that just before this talk oh, about, okay. uh, about farming. You know, it's not, it's not just unique to Singapore. In the United Kingdom, uh, people have increasingly during lockdown, and you know, our lockdowns have been very brutal, uh, have the, the in thing now is to grow plants in your house uh, or to, to, to grow stuff. We have a garden, so we've been, you know, my wife has been trying to grow tomatoes with uh, actually pretty good success, I have to admit. Uh, gotten quite a number of meals out of that uh, and but yeah I mean I, I wouldn't say it's gentrified but I think it when people are deprived of doing things that they're used to going out socializing stuff like that they try to find meaning in other things right and uh, I think one one of the things that that farming or growing things allows us to reconnect with uh, with practice. And when I mean practice, I mean actually doing something with your hands uh, that isn't internet centric or te technology centric. I don't grow stuff. I kill anything I touch. So I, uh, I've been picking up woodworking, but it's the same kind of effect, the kind of uh, manipulating something and then seeing it grow and seeing it become something else um, like at the start of Hui Ying's talk, she talked about like farming is actually like having a family, right? You're always worried about your plants. You can't have a holiday. Uh, what if it dies and you feel really bad if something goes wrong? It's the same thing, but there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction that comes with it. I don't know, Hui Ying, what do you think? Uh, I, I'd like to take the chance to also uh, answer Tom's question because there's a little bit of an overlap. 
So uh, to yeah to your question that uh, do I see this project as as a record a document you know as something that's part of history I think definitely because any photo that you know once is taken it's a record of time and you know it's it's uh, yeah because I, I imagine that my my photos my work will be even more valuable let's say ten years down the road twenty years down the road you know and uh, it's it's not just a personal history right because it's, it's a shared history for Singaporeans because. You know, back in the 50s, 60s, we were still very much an agricultural country. Like, I'm sure like everybody knows how to grow vegetables or they do in their backyard and they, they keep chickens, you know. And it's, it's because of uh, development that, you know, that we change, um, that we're no longer living that kind of lifestyle. And uh, it's, I, I think it's also uh, something for us to think about going forward. It's not just pure nostalgia because uh, imagination, you know, uh, uh, is based on our history, based on our past. So, you know, when you need to think about, okay, what can we do in, in the future? I, I think it's, um, it's, it's what we've been talking about, right? About uh, connecting back to, to, to nature, about, um, you know, growing your own food. And in the process of growing your own food, that's when you will really appreciate um, appreciate the value of it, the freshness of it, especially um, those that's grown locally. And that, that's very much to do with food sustainability because it's about appreciating your food, about uh, reducing waste. And I, I feel that's one of the ways that, um, that to do that, you know, to, yeah, to grow your own food and also, uh, yeah, appreciating um, the, the local produce. So I, I think that's, that's the way forward in terms of uh, food sustainability. Thank you for sharing that. We have one more question in the Q&A, which is what are the reactions of the people featured in the works when they saw themselves in the book or exhibition? I think just to add to this, um, another question I wanted to ask was whether during your editing process with Hubin, um, your family members were also involved in any way and whether they had any insights on what was missing, what they would prefer to have kept in or not. Um, okay, let me answer the second question first. Uh, no, my, my family members is, uh, they were not really involved in uh, in the in, in the curation uh, process. But uh, I do have to highlight that there was a little bit of a conflict. Um, so the photo of my uh, where my where my auntie fell, right? Um, she she kind of actually didn't want the photo to be to be publicized to be used. Um, then, uh, but there was an earlier documentation. Uh, it's a video commissioned by FT. So that photo was used and I didn't tell her. Um, uh, yeah, so she, she got kind of upset uh, that, you know, that the photo was used, uh, but I managed to kind of like uh, talk to her, talk to my uncle, and then they finally decided, okay, you know, it's, it's fine for, for the photo to be used in the book. So yeah, lucky for that because otherwise, uh, because for me, that's, that's a very crucial uh, event that happened uh, on, on the um, so it was important for for that image to yeah to be used. Um, so the the origin the, the first part of the question was oh what's the reaction? Uh, unfortunately, many of them haven't seen it yet. Um, so I, I I'm trying to persuade my family to, you know to come down later uh, as in, in in the next two weeks before the exhibition closed because they're just not you know not the I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make it an event because otherwise they're just not, they're just not excited about, oh, you know, she's having a photo exhibition, let's go. Um, yeah, but uh, I do have a cousin with uh, three young kids who, who three young, uh, you know, daughters who came down. Uh, they were quite excited, like they were, you know, like uh, looking at the photos and trying to identify, trying to identify who is who, and then they saw photos of themselves when they were babies. Yeah, so I think that was, uh, for me, that, that was quite, that was quite interesting. Mm. All right, thank you for sharing. We have just a few more moments. So if anybody has any further questions, comments, please do feel free to share. As uh, Ori had mentioned, uh, she would really love to hear um, people's uh, views and opinions on the exhibition or the work as well. Uh, perhaps while we just wait to see if any further questions come in, uh, would you like to share a bit, Ori, about how um, this project connects with your practice and your interest in um, you know, what I understand to be issues of development throughout Southeast Asia and the impact that they have on various communities. Mm. So um, after, so I, I have um, like two other long-term projects uh, in, in progress. So one of, one of it is uh, looking at the impact of high-speed railway train that's being built in Laos 
and then the other one is uh, the impact of Mekong, uh, impact of dams that's being built on the Mekong River, both you know in Laos and Cambodia and also in Vietnam. Um, after a while, I, I kind of realized that my work has a common theme, which is looking at development, especially in Southeast Asia, and you know what's what's the environmental impact, what's the cost of it. Um, I, I think it's very much because of this experience of having gone through that. Even though I was just uh, nine when when we moved from Congo to uh, to um, to the pig, uh, to the vegetable farm, right? Um, at, at that time, I, I I felt that it was a it was it was life changing because you know uh, I I went from having all that space you know constantly surrounded by family by cousins and then we moved to a HDB flat right because that there's no longer that uh, everybody's living together on the farm. Um, and then I changed school. So overnight, you know, like my life changed. And, um, and for me as a kid, the impact was most of because you, you don't have control over what's happening. I mean, you didn't know what, what's happening, right? So I can imagine, but of course we were, we were lucky that we, we have the resources to kind of manage the transition. So for me, I think, you know, uh, the, the communities, a lot of the communities that I photograph, uh, it's the same, it's kind of the same process for them. Uh, they can, they have, they have no control over what's happening. They don't know what's, uh, what's coming. And, uh, and, and the unfortunate thing is that they don't have a lot of resources to, to manage that transition. And also, I, I really want to look at uh, the idea of development. Is it always about building bigger, better, and more high-tech uh, you know, infrastructure, for example? Um, when what, what you have is already what's existing you know, works, or maybe it just needs a little bit of improvement that doesn't uh, involve such a, up, uh, such a big upheaval right, of people's life, of the environment. So yeah, so that's, that's, what, um, yeah, that's what I'm interested in, and that's what I'm exploring in my work as well. All right, thank you for sharing. We have uh, one more question that's just come in from Chisai, who lives in uh, Kyoto in Japan. Uh, they say, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Some friends, on, some friends on Facebook said they stopped work or quit their jobs and changed to farming or living in local areas with farms after COVID-19 started. Um, do, you, do you think this situation Sounds familiar. Have you have you heard of this uh, from others as well, perhaps? And um, they also mentioned that uh, past farmers can teach many things, which I think must definitely be true. Um, I I think in Singapore, yeah, I think in Singapore we don't have the luxury of quitting our job and working, you know, at a farm because we, we don't have that many farms uh, in the first place to, to to begin with. But I'm sure if we do, I'm sure that will be happening. Uh, but what we are seeing is uh, a lot of young people, especially, um, you know, they, they, they're exploring uh, farming as a career option, which is, you know, which is not common at all with uh, my generation. Because uh, like, yeah, I mean, one, one of the, uh, one of, one of uh, visitors to the exhibition, he's, he looks kind of young, like maybe late 20s. He's, I think he, he never uh, imagined that farming would be a possible uh, career because in school, you know, they, they just, yeah, they're just not being uh, stated. Um, and um, yes, I think I, I do agree that a lot of farmers, right, uh, they can teach us many things. Um, so uh, I, I have also interacted with uh, other farmers in Singapore and I find that there's a lot of uh, common things that they share. So a lot of them are very resilient um, when they when they have when they meet with challenges and obstacles. They're always thinking about uh, ways to overcome them, and also they're very creative in problem solving. And uh, I think that's something that uh, both this resilience and creativity is something that they kind of lost now. Uh, and yeah, it's something that we, we we should all have. You know, we should all learn from them to uh, yeah to overcome all these challenges in, in, in our life. All right, thank you so much. So uh, we're just about uh, approaching the end of the event. Um, a few comments are still coming in in the chat box, which perhaps uh, you can read through. Uh, it's really great to hear how the project has resonated with so many people from all over the world, countries like uh, Germany, I think, and Japan. So um, I'll just wrap up with a few things. I'm going to launch a short survey that you will see pop up on your screen. Your feedback will be really helpful to us as we plan our future events. So please do take a couple of moments to fill out the poll. And we also... 
So uh, we have come to the end of the event. So um, Objectives is a nonprofit registered charity and many of our programs are presented free of charge or affordably in order to ensure wide accessibility. So your support will be really helpful to help us continue presenting a diverse array of programs that remain accessible to a wide range of audiences. So if you would like to support us, you can scan the QR code on the left of your screen. And you can also stay in touch with us uh, by joining our mailing list by signing up through the QR code on the right of the screen. Um, we also have the exhibition running at Objectives Chapel Gallery till the 29th of August. Um, admission is free. And uh, this is a photo of the photo book that has been launched. So it will be available at a special price of $48 for the duration of the exhibition. And while stocks last along with your purchase, you will also receive a complimentary copy of We Are Farmers, um, an earlier publication that um, was referenced earlier in conjunction, it was produced in conjunction with uh, Singapore's 50th year of independence. So it's also available through our online store. You can scan the QR code, or I will send out an email to the attendees later that also pull together some of the um, you know, some of the links mentioned, some of the videos mentioned, such as the Straits Times one. Uh, we will still be around for a few moments. So if you do have any further questions uh, or comments, you can feel free to leave them. I think uh, there is just one more question that, uh, you know, since we have a couple of moments, we can chat about. But um, thank you all again once for joining us. So um, Angie says, apart from having closer access to subject matter, did you find yourself shooting with a different aesthetic? compared to other projects. Uh, not really familiar with your other works, but I find some of the pictures so beautiful, even though it may be a sad picture. Thanks, thanks for the question, Angie. Um, I, for me, all my personal projects uh, are done, are shot with uh, medium format film, uh, yeah, film camera. Um, I, of course, you know, not all projects are suitable for that format. Uh, but somehow the, the, the projects that I've started have initiated all kind of work. And I really enjoyed uh, the process of shooting, especially with a medium format uh, camera because it, it's kind of slow. It's really slow. You have to really think about um, your framing, you know, what, what's in front of you, what to shoot because, you know, each roll of film only has 12 frames and, you know, it costs to, it costs to buy the film, cause to develop them, and then you still have to scan them later. And uh, I, I think the process um, also kind of suits my personality because I'm generally quite a slow person. I, I like to take my time uh, to do things. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's why I'm shooting my, all my personal projects with that. I have been, uh, but, but for my assignments, uh, it's mostly in digital just because of the, uh, you know, it, it needs to be, uh, the, the turnover is quite high and yeah, not many publications are willing to, to, to pay the extra cost for that. But I have been successful in um, uh, getting two assignments to, you know, two publications to commission me to shoot in uh, medium format film. So hopefully, you know, that more of that will come. And uh, before, before we end, I also like to uh, mention that the book, um, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, starting an online store for the book. Um, yeah, it, it's taking a while, but uh, so you, after the exhibition, so you can get the book either at Objectives or um, through my online store. In the meantime, you can just uh, PM me <laughs> on Facebook or um, social media or email. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a good night, stay safe, and we do hope to see you again at Objectives.